Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a game from round two of the 77th Tata Steel Chess Tournament 2015, held in Vikenze, Netherlands. And we're going to have a look at a game from the Challenger section, the Group B section, between Wei from China, playing on the white side, against Russia's Vladimir Potkin. Uh, this is the first game I'm covering by Wei, so just a little bit of insight about him. He is only 15 and a half years old. Uh, he became a grandmaster at the age of 13 years, 8 months, and 23 days to be exact. And fast forward approximately 8 months from the time he became a grandmaster, it's at that time he became the youngest player ever to break the 2600 mark. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side here, his current rating is 2675 and I believe it's not long off we could see him breaking 2,700, uh, quite possibly before he even turns 16. Uh, the current list, if you're curious, the current list of 2,700 and above players, the youngest player on that list is Richard Rappert from Hungary, who's 18 years old, who will be 19 years old in just about two months from now. So to say that Wei is a incredibly talented player is probably an understatement. So let's have a look. We have, again, Wei on the white side, opening up with e4. Pakin replying with the French defense. d4, d5. Knight c3, knight f6. And with e5, we enter the Steinitz variation. The knight dropping back to d7. And we have the typical reinforcement first of e5 and only then knight f3, and now the typical strike at the base point with c5, and this is where a lot of the attention will be centered for these next few moves. Black applying pressure, white being there to defend. A little bit of expansion by black on the queen side with b5, bishop d3, and now black opts for the move b4. That is not the only move. Another one is queen b6 adding some more pressure to d4. But in comes b4. White, with these next few moves, is going to get kicked around. This is the first the first of many kicks. Knight a4. c4. Bishop needs to drop back. And now c3. The queen also needs to drop back. Well, I don't know about drop, ba drop back, but she has to react instead of capturing on c3. My initial thought here was that queen d1 was clever. I thought that this was some type of gambit that black was going for initially when c3 was played. I thought after takes, takes, well maybe black has some play. Uh, being able to now make use of the b4 square in other words and maybe play along the b file. But I was completely wrong with that. You simply cannot take on c3 because of the move queen a5 and this knight is in a well, he's in serious trouble. You can't go to b2 because you're getting forked. And so where else are you going to go here? This is just bad news for team white. So you just cannot take on c3 is what I'm getting at. Queen d1 was played. And let's just take a moment here to assess what just happened there with those last few moves. Um, black is expanding on the queen side. b4 c4, white's having to go back, c3, white's having to go back. There must be some cost connected with these advances, and there is. It's related to this d4 pawn. The c4 pawn, or I should just say the c pawn, has clearly had uh, a different thing in mind. Played to c4, it inconvenienced the light square bishop. It played to c3, it inconvenienced the white queen. She's underdeveloping. Uh, the cost, however, is that this d4 will not need as much support by white. And not long off, this bishop will be getting right back on this b1 to h7 diagonal. So black was successful with kicking white back a bit, breaking up this queenside pawn structure. But again, white won't have so much an issue with reinforcing the d4 pawn. And this knight, we could also go further and say that he will have no no chance of getting into the e4 square now that the d4 pawn 
is on board. So after C takes B, we have Knight takes B. Some more development by both sides here, getting castled. Bishop gets right back on that diagonal. And in comes F5. This is a big moment here in the game. So far, 15 moves in. And not so much, t uh, not too much time has been spent. Uh, whenever there's that possibility, I've said this plenty of times, whenever there's that possibility for a structural change, uh, structural shift, there's some thinking to be done for sure. Being able to accurately assess how the pieces will function within a structure is very important. We have the next move here, G4. You could clearly see that about uh, 20 minutes was spent on that move because you do have to uh, consider, well, what if, you know, what if this capture is occurring here? Uh, the follow-up would need to be knight g5. And on that, we could have this capture, the rooks being exchanged, and uh, is there a way to uh, still get at uh, the black king? Is there a way to get this pawn and continue with some attack? I'm not so sure about that. When we compare it to what happened in the game, what we end up having is white generating a very strong attack. Black did not go for this capture here. I believe that uh, if we could do it over again, an improvement would be at a later game to follow through and actually take on g4. But instead of that, we have something much different. Black investing some time here, grabbing some queenside space, looking to inconvenience the knight and actually do one of these things here, sinking a knight into the white position. Uh, the squares b2 and c3 become possibilities for the knight once he's on that a4 square. So after a5, we have now g takes f, e takes f, and with that uh, shift, with that capture, I should say, this is now a connected pass pawn. And we have a half-open G file to work with on the white side. So we can expect king to h1 at some point. This is something I found instructive. Uh, white does not play king h1 immediately. Something that's maybe important to recognize here is that uh, black is maybe looking to eliminate their light square bishop. So instead of going with what may seem like a routine king h1 and rook g1, white is, of course, um, very aware of uh, move order here, maybe not so quick to allow this possibility. And so instead first plays queen e2, a developing move, and also interfering with what it is black may very well want to do, deploy the bishop, exchange light square bishops. Okay, so queen e2 first, black goes in for repositioning their knight, and only at this point king h1, a4, rook g1, a3, knight d1, knight a4, so two possibilities here, and now we have rook g3, the start of not only the doubling on the g file, but also, well, more specifically, we're going to have the tripling on the g file soon enough. So black is anticipating more pressure being added to g7, rook f7. This also paves the way for queen f8 or even bishop f8. One of the downsides, however, with uh, this type of defense of the g7 square is that the knight starts to have uh, better prospects of contributing to the attack, be jumping into that g5 post. So there might be a reason, in other words, to commit the queen as a defender. She's not the greatest defender in the world, and you don't really want to have her be the first one to defend something, but it may be necessary is what I'm getting at to keep the bishop uh, having a watchful eye over g5. So we have now queen g2, knight c3, and this is where you can't see it right now, but there's a pretty significant uh, evaluation shift with that move, knight c3. And also quite a bit of time spent, about, what, 26 um, minutes was spent by black on this move, knight c3. I'm not sure what else was being considered here. I imagine knight b2 was considered. Um, on knight b2, if you're taking, well, this rook is brought to life, and at least you're giving white something to think about. 
this being now a past pawn just one square away from queening. Um, I imagine if knight b2 was played, white would simply not take, not give black that type of activity, not give black a passed pawn, and instead play knight f2, just getting out of the way and preparing to triple up on the g file. Um, we didn't have that. I think it was uh, an improvement. Uh, I Actually, I know that it was an improvement over uh, knight c3. Of course, I have... Uh, my friend here that's uh, helping me, the uh, computer evaluation, but uh, yeah, knight b2 it seems like was a, a more testing approach instead of knight c3. On knight c3, white's able to just get that guy, and there's no there's no worry of a passed pawn, and white's able to carry on with an attack here, getting these pieces tripled up. This was this next move here, bishop to b5, is one that I uh, found instructive, similar to that earlier. Uh, as mentioned, queen e2 move may seem quite tempting to immediately triple up on that g file, and that's quite all right to do it right away. But I believe what white has in mind by first playing bishop to b5 runs as follows. Let, let's, let's do a quick comparison of these two moves, bishop b5 and rook to g1. Again, both are fine. Both are good. Uh, if you're playing, however, this move first, I'm questioning right now, I'm trying to draw your attention here to... Uh, move order. If the rook plays to g1, there is queen f8. However, after bishop to b5, this knight can now drop back to d8. White will have still a good reply here, but I think white didn't even want to allow this possibility of the knight going to d8 and then making use of this ideal post on e6, ideal because it blockades this passed pawn and also exerts pressure on the d4 and f4 squares. Compare this move, compare bishop b5, still comparing bishop b5 and rook g1. If bishop b5 is played immediately, and it is, it's the move played in the game, notice how this knight is not able to react in a way where it can drop back to d8. The queen at this moment is occupying that square. Uh, it still works, however. If rook g1 is played and after queen f8, bishop b5, this move can now be met with this sharp reply, bishop to e8. It's a cute move. You're going to win the exchange here. If you're taking the bishop, you're getting mated in just three moves, starting with that. So either move was fine, but I found it a little bit instructive to see the bishop b5 move played prior to tripling up on the g file. So the reply here was queen b6, defense and attack of the bishop, but that's ignored. Rook g1, this is a more serious issue, tripling up, ready to give mate. Black needs to defend that. Bishop f8. So again, uh, this g5 square is now a jumping point for the knight. Rook h3, leaving this bishop out yet again to be captured. Um... If you capture it right now, what's going to happen? Instead instead of this g6 move, the move played in the game, what if we capture the bishop here? It's a very nice tactical shot. White would now have rook takes h7. And if king takes rook, this is already a checkmate in five. Starting first with queen g6 and knight g5. This is big trouble. Mate threat on h7. The only way to defend mate is to move the bishop. There goes your rook, and soon enough, there goes your king. So this is a, having a sharp eye on this tactic here of investing even more material, but following up with this uh, excellent uh, combination of pieces, the queen and knight attacking the king. Uh, very sharp play. No time to take the bishop. g6 was tried. White yet again leaves this bishop out. Instead, putting pressure on the rook and h7, looking to crash through here, and then finally break through on the g6 pawn. It, o it is only at this time that black uh, goes in for queen takes bishop. Not sure that there's uh, better options here. So you might as well pick up some material, I guess. Um, there's not going to be a good defense here. White takes the rook. Let's have, a look. I guess, a quick look at something else. If rook here, let's say defending the 7th rank more, there can follow. Rook takes h7. Rook takes, knight takes. 
rook takes, and don't forget about d5. There goes the knight. White's now not going to be down any material, and the uh, attack uh, continues on. So, really not a good defense. In the game, we had queen takes bishop, knight takes rook, knight e7. If king takes knight, this is getting crushed with check, check, and this one quiet move, rook f7 is nice. After bishop here, there's even a queen sack variation, queen d6. On bishop takes, this will lead to a mate in one, two. So... Knight is basically immune from capture. What's tried is knight e7. Knight h6. Bishop takes knight, rook takes. And now black tries to defend this h7 pawn, but there's not really a good way to do that. Queen h3. This knight needs to move, and he only has one legal move in order to defend h7. On knight h6, if knight h, or excuse me, if knight c6 is played, there would follow rook takes g6. And on pawn takes rook, this will lead to a mate in four. Queen h7, grabbing here, and then giving mate. So, what is tried instead after queen h3 is queen e2. Rook takes h7, queen takes c2, and this is already a mate in six. Rook gives check, queen gives check. Rook takes g6, and it's at this point that black resigns. A very strong attack. There's not a, a way to defend here. On knight takes rook, queen takes, and queen e8. And one other cute variation is on king to d7, there's queen takes knight, followed by a mate in one and two. So a very sharp attacking game. Again, I believe uh, the big point in the game was related to the pawn structure. Again, we saw the decision first related uh, to the pawn structure on the queen side. Black opting to damage the queen side pawn structure with these advances, rocking white back just a little bit, but at the same time releasing pressure on the d4 pawn. White soon getting right back on that diagonal. And right here, the big decision point after g4 to take or not, I believe taking is going to be the better option, but instead we had the advancement on the queen side, the g-file opening up, this queen e2 move prior to king h1 I found instructive, and also at this point right here, knight to b2 would have been another interesting try, not allowing this uh, quick tripling up on the g-file. Very nice attacking game. Bishop b5 was the other one, that's what I wanted to mention, instead of uh, queen e2 was the one key detail, and also bishop to b5 prior to what seems so natural to put immediate pressure on g7. Important to recognize that this is quite possibly a very strong defensive uh, maneuver that black would have. As mentioned, it wouldn't really work out because of that bishop to e8 move, but still recognizing what it is that black can be doing to try and reposition or try to defend against the pressure on g7. A knight on that e6 square is just doing great things. So, yeah, very strong attack, ignoring the pressure on the bishop for several moves and just crashing right through against the black king side. Very strong attacking game by this uh, clearly incredibly talented player. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.